Hello, this is Leadership Live. I'm David Rubenstein coming to you from my home in Bethesda, Maryland. On this show, I've been talking to executives about how they're managing through the COVID-19 crisis. And today we're very fortunate to have Michael Evans, who's the president of Alibaba. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, David. Nice to be with you. Where am I getting you today? Where are you coming from? You're getting me in Canada, where I am, uh, have spent quite a lot of time over the last couple of months working. I should disclose to people that don't know Michael that well, that Michael is a Canadian, but he also is beyond being a business executive and we'll go through his career in a moment. He was an Olympic athlete who won a gold medal in the 1984 Olympics. So what was that like to win a gold medal? Uh, well, the thrill of victory for sure, um, but also a very emotional experience. And in full disclosure, I did it with my twin brother in the boat as well. So that was a, a particularly unusual and unique moment in our relationship and also for our family. So you are still a rower? You still row for fun now? Casually only. Okay. So let's talk about the company you're the president of. And some people might be surprised that a Canadian is the president of Alibaba, which is well known to be a Chinese based company. So just give us a little bit about how you came to be the president of Alibaba, which is based in China. Well, it's a bit of a circuitous story, but I'll give you the highlights. I first met Jack Ma in Hangzhou in 1999, and he was just starting Alibaba. And I, at the time, was working for Goldman Sachs, and we were making an investment in the company. And what attracted me or what caught my attention was actually not the investment, but the mission that Jack had for the company, which was to look after the little guy, small businesses. I thought that was quite unique in the big corporate world of banking. So I stayed in touch with him and his team over the next 15 years, actually ended up spending almost nine years living in Asia. So actually got quite close to Jack. And when I left Goldman Sachs in 2013, the first people to call were Jack and Joe Tsai. And they said, hey, we're gonna take this company public. We want you to come on the board, which I did, helped them get public. And immediately after they went public, and I should have seen this coming, they said, why don't you join our team and help us globalize? Because you know us, you know Alibaba, you know China, you can be very helpful in the globalization effort. And so I did. And, you know, looking back on that, David, I have to say uh, that was a huge opportunity and, you know, hard to believe a dream come true. To be able to work with those three guys, Jack, Joe, Daniel, Jang, to be able to work for arguably the third, second, most important technology company in the world and to share Jack's vision, but also my passion for China. That, that was a dream come true. In the lore of Goldman Sachs, there's a story, maybe it's apocryphal, you can tell me that Goldman made an investment that you alluded to, but that somebody came along and said, well, we don't need this investment in Alibaba. So they sold it at a very modest profit. Is that true? Well, in the continuation of apocryphal stories, it's perhaps the case that two years after they made the investment, they might've sold it at the same time that NASDAQ and technology companies in 2001 went bust. So um, that could have happened. So for those people that live in, let's say the United States or somewhere outside of China, and they don't know as much about Alibaba as let's say people in China, or as you do, what does Alibaba do? I know it as a company that sort of does what Amazon does, but I know it's much different. Tell me what Alibaba really does. Well, Alibaba in some respects is a huge uh, e-commerce company like Amazon, but in almost every other respect, completely different. Its core operations are in China. There's a very large cloud business, very large e-commerce business, very significant logistics business and digital media and entertainment business. And it's become the leader in China, you know, with almost a trillion, more than a trillion US dollars of GMV sales and over 700 million consumers on our platform. What it does internationally though, and in particular what it does in the US is still a mystery to most people because we don't have a platform in the US. So we're not here selling products in the same way that an Amazon or an eBay or other um, e-commerce operators would. But what we do, which is very significant, is we sell tens of billions of US dollars of great American products from brands, from retailers, from SMEs, even from farmers to the Chinese consumer directly. 
And we've been doing this for almost 15 years. It's a business that continues to grow. And particularly in the COVID environment, China has become, the China consumer has become so important to many US brands and small businesses because that's where they see growth and the ability to benefit in the post COVID environment. So a lot of American companies say there are plenty of Chinese consumers. I'd like to sell to them. And the easiest way without setting up shop, I guess, physically in China is to do it through Alibaba. Is that correct? We had, yes, it is, David. We have multiple platforms, some for cross border, some for, you know, the big brands like Starbucks and P and G and others that are physically resident in the country. But across those many platforms, we provide the access point for thousands and thousands of brands and tens of thousands of SMEs to sell their products to the Chinese consumer. Now today, the market value of Alibaba is roughly $700 billion, something like that. Mm -hmm. And your number of employees is over 100,000, is that right? Yeah, about 120,000. Okay. So today, uh, there's also something that's happened post COVID, as I understand it. Many people in the United States want to get products like uh, PPE products for healthcare related benefits. And the only source was China. So you sold a lot of products, I assume, through Alibaba to Americans to help them with through the COVID crisis. Is that right? Not quite. First of all, there are other sources of PPE, Korea and certain other markets. But our principal focus in terms of thinking about how to help with PPE and other medical products was to help source and vet countries as opposed to sell all of those products through our platform. So the work that I did with Governor Cuomo, for example, for New York State was really not to sell New York State products through our platform, but to help source from reliable providers and also vet the quality of the product before the procurement teams bought it. So Governor Cuomo or his staff contacted you and said, we are having trouble getting PPE. Can you help us? Is that essentially what happened? And you helped facilitate that? No, a little bit the other way around, which is I called Governor Cuomo and said, I'm a Canadian, but live in New York City and care about my state and the city. It's becoming clear to me that New York is becoming the epicenter of coronavirus in the United States. What can we do? What can I do to help? And he said, wow, he said, this is great. Please, let's talk, let's figure it out. And together with his team, we did a huge amount of vetting and sourcing of PPE for New York State and for the hospitals. So in China, is there been a shutdown of the whole country the way the United States sort of shut down and everybody's been working from home? Or has it just been in the Wuhan area that people were, were kind of shut down? No, there was a period of time when Wuhan was clearly a major problem and infection was starting to spread beyond the province that they shut the whole country down. And we have employees all over China, many concentrated in Hangzhou and Beijing, Shanghai, places like that, but also in many other places, particularly for our B2B business. And we sent all of them home to work from home for several months. So in that case, how did you service your employees? I, through technology, you can obviously communicate, but if people want to buy an Alibaba product or on your Alibaba uh, platform, you had to have people at the warehouses putting it in and then shipping it, is that right? You're correct. So there were a small number of employees that were still required to have a physical presence in key parts of our business, not least of which is the technology platform to make sure that it would continue to run properly. But the vast majority of our employees were working for home, from home virtually. In the logistics businesses, and you focused on an important area, we're delivering more than 80 million packages a day. So in order to continue to satisfy the demand of consumers who were ordering even more things online, it's very important to get that logistics business running properly and to figure out how to do it safely for the employees, but also for the customers who are receiving the packages. Now, the employees who are working from home, is it now that they're back in their offices or they're still working at home to some extent? Substantially, everybody in China is back in our many offices but almost all of our international employees are still working from home. So in your case, you are working from the United States uh, and obviously from one of your homes, let's say. Uh, how difficult has it been to do that? It hasn't been very difficult. It's just been such a huge change. On average, I was going to China once or twice a month. So 15 to 20 times a year. 
I haven't taken a trip to China since after you and I saw each other in Davos this year. Right. And the quarantine restrictions make it almost impossible to go there and be able to work. So I expect that for the rest of this year, we will have to continue to conduct things virtually. So that's, that's been a little bit of a, of, a, of a big, it's a big shift, it's a huge shift. But, you know, the silver lining has allowed me to spend a lot more time with my family, so that's been great. And Alibaba is not trying, I guess, to compete with Amazon in the United States. In other words, setting up a whole infrastructure of the type that Amazon has, that is not in your immediate plans because you've already got a big market in China and other countries, is that fair? Our immediate plans in the US are to keep doing what we're doing. It is such a big cross-border business, sending all those products to China. Uh, it's so beneficial to those brands and those SMEs and farmers. We're gonna keep doing that. That is going to be our major focus for quite some time. Now, I knew Jeff Bezos uh, when he first started the company pretty much. And uh, at that time he told me he had better software and I kind of rolled my eyes because there were other people already selling books over the internet. Uh, Barnes and Noble was already selling books over the internet. What is it that Alibaba did that made it uh, transcend all the other companies that were doing similar things to what Alibaba does? There, was there a secret sauce that Alibaba had that made it rise up to be the top company in this area? You know, if you go back to the early days, David, and you think about the internet in China, in 1999, when Jack started this company, the internet was well known to all of us in the West but people were just reading about the internet in China. Nobody really knew how to use it, much less commercialize it. And what Jack did is he figured out how to do that. And in doing that, he also was able to develop a sustainable business model that could grow. So that was the beginning of the B2B business, which then became the B2C business. But he did two other things that were very important and allowed him to very much distinguish himself from the rest of the competition. His mission was to help the little guy, the small business. And that seemed like a peculiar mission to many people because why not run after the big corporations? And then he developed the culture, which was one of customer first, employees second and shareholders third. And people found that very strange, including us when I was at Goldman Sachs, when we made the investment in 1999. But that coupled together with the innovation looking after the customer, thinking about how to grow their businesses, that became the secret sauce because none of those customers ever wanted to leave. Did Jack Ma have a background as a technology person? Was he an engineer, an investment banker, private equity person? What was his background that enabled him to have these insights? None of the things that you just suggested. In fact, <laughs> Jack regularly jokes that he doesn't know how to, how to use a computer. Jack was an English teacher. Okay, but that teacher and the teaching skills that he has were hugely important in developing the company, instilling the culture and the values in the leadership team and in the employees and growing the business. And he's still a teacher today. Uh, he's largely retired from the company now. I think he's gonna get off the board at some point in the near future. And uh, is that right? He's retired from the company, that's correct. But another of the founders is still involved in the company. That's Joe Tsai, who's known to Americans as the owner of the basketball team at the, uh, the Nets. Is that right? Right. That's correct. So he's still pretty actively involved. Joe is our executive vice chairman. He's very actively involved in the day-to-day -day businesses. I speak to him two or three times a week, and he's a, he's a core member of our senior leadership team. So given the U.S.-China relationship post-COVID, which is obviously a little more tense than it was pre-COVID, What's it like to be the president of a Chinese-based company operating in the United States? Is it more difficult to get things done? Do you have government people coming after you a little bit, telling you uh, to do this or that? Or what's it like? Actually, it's not difficult at all because people are always surprised when I sit down with them, U.S. government officials, and I talk to them about what we're doing in the United States. And they become very supportive when they start to understand the impact and the scale of what's being sold by American companies to the Chinese consumer. Uh, they may have had misperceptions about what we were doing based on what other Chinese companies do, but once they hear the story and they understand it, they're very supportive. And they understand that that is going to be our core mission in the US going forward. 
Now, many of the CEOs with whom I've talked on the show say that their employees are working remotely, but actually some of them don't really want to come back to work until there's a vaccine, or some of them actually after a vaccine say, I can work from home very efficiently. Are your employees in the United States and in China actually interested in working from home more than they did before? The bulk of our employees outside of China and even in China want to make sure that when they return to work, they can do so safely. That's the real prerequisite. But all of us would like to be back in the office. And the thing that we miss the most is not the ability to run the business properly and to continue to grow it, but the interaction, which is a huge part of our culture, one-to-one -one and within groups. You can't really replicate that virtually. So the tension between the United States and China, other than in COVID, is often over technology related things. As you know, the United States government has said, we don't want Huawei to be used for 5G technology. I don't know whether your company uses fi uh, Huawei technology, I assume in China it does, but it, how would you try to explain that issue to an American audience about Huawei or about technology or the tensions between the United States and China over technology? I think it's very hard to, you know, actively engage on that issue with our clients. What our clients really wanna know, what our customers wanna know is how can you help us, particularly during COVID, but before COVID and long after COVID, how can you help us grow our business? So the conversations I'm having, David, with CEOs of hundreds of brands all the time is, how's your business doing in China? And the response back, particularly in the last several months, it's growing much faster than they expected. Part of that is a very rapid recovery, which you've seen recently in the uh, GDP results and the National Bureau of Statistics and data information on retail in China. But the other part of it is that the repatriation effect of no Chinese people traveling abroad and spending money means that those same Chinese people are actually now buying those products, those US products in China. So many of these CEOs see their China business growing very, very rapidly. And they're pleased about that because it's not doing as well in other parts of the world. Now, Amazon has done so well in the United States, it almost doesn't have a number two competing with it. Uh, does Alibaba have a number two or is there somebody even close to Alibaba or you're so dominant just as Amazon is in the United States? We have a number two, a number three and a number four. And we, <laughs> one of our biggest challenges is the need to aggressively and continuously innovate in order to stay ahead of our competitors. We like our competitors because we learn a lot from them about things that we should also be doing or think ways to change our business model. But we have huge competition in China and it's a, it's a big part of keeping us sharp and allowing us to um, provide the digital tools to our merchants and, and you know, the ease of doing business on our platform for consumers. Now, if I sit in the United States and I want to buy something that Alibaba has on its platform, let's suppose Amazon doesn't have it, or I just want the thrill of buying something from China, can I go onto your website, is it in English, and buy something from, from Alibaba and will it be shipped to me in the United States? Yes and yes. You can go on a uh, platform called AliExpress. Um, you can, AliExpress.com, you'll find it. And you'll find millions of products there, which you can buy directly from China and they will be shipped and delivered to you in the United States. Um, that's not a huge business for us and it's not our core strategic focus, but it is a platform that exists, has been around for many years. And it's basically selling Chinese products, small business products, to about 130 countries around the world, including the US. Well, let's forget the US for a moment. Do you have a large business outside of China in Asia or in Africa, Latin America, Europe? Are there other countries or parts of the world where you are very big compared to where you are in the United States where you're not as big in terms of selling products? Yes, yeah, so we have a very large, this has really been my responsibility uh, as part of uh, leading the globalization effort, but we have a very large business in Southeast Asia called Lazada. We have a business in South Asia uh, called Daras. We have a smaller business in India uh, called Paytm. We have a big joint venture in Russia. Um, we own a business called Trendyol in uh, Turkey. And the common thread for all these businesses is that they're local platforms. So we're dealing with local markets and local consumers and local products. We overlay products from China in terms of cross-border sales on top of that. But yes, we have, we have more than 10,000 people working outside of, uh, of China who are actively engaged in these local platforms.
But still, I would assume 75 or 80% of your business is still in China. Is that fair? Something like that? Yeah, probably a little bit more than that, David. But I think particularly as it relates to the cross-border businesses, where we book our revenues and sales is very different than the huge impact that we have on companies in countries like the United States, but all over Europe, you, you know, Japan, um, Australia, New Zealand, where we source these products in order to get them to the Chinese consumer. I should have asked you, where did the name Alibaba come from? I know what Alibaba is in a kind of myth, but why was Alibaba chosen as the name? Jack chose Alibaba because it's open sesame. So for small businesses, this was the opportunity to come on the platform and open the cave of riches. And that's exactly what's happened because we started with probably 20, 20 small businesses on the platform initially, and we have over 11 million today. So this has been a huge opportunity for small businesses to grow, to take advantage of digital tools and to become profitable, hire more people and prosper. Now, many years ago when Alibaba was started, or I guess in its early years, it developed its own equivalent of PayPal, which is an own way to kind of pay for products that you buy on Alibaba. It later became known as Ant Financial Separated. I should disclose my company, Carlisle, has an investment in that. But what's the status of, uh, of that company, Ant Financial? Is that a separate company? Are you involved in that company in any way? I'm not involved as the president of Alibaba in Ant Financial, but Ant Financial and Alipay in particular works very closely with Alibaba. Uh, because it is the payment basis for all, all the customers, consumers on our platform. But of course, Ant Financial, in which Alibaba owns a 33% stake, is an independent company and continues to grow um, both in China and outside of China. So some people will have seen just yesterday or last night that um, there was an announcement that they're planning to go public, which is terrific for them. Public in Hong Kong. Public in Hong Kong and uh, in Shanghai. So a dual listing. And for a company like Alibaba, the controversy going on in Hong Kong is not that relevant because your core business is China and not Hong Kong. And that has that produced any tensions within the company or problems for you? What's going on in Hong Kong now? Look, we're a corporation. Uh, we're not part of the government. We, the geopolitical tensions and the tensions even between China and Hong Kong or China, the US and Hong Kong, these are not areas that we're gonna be able to resolve. Um, or that are going to have a material impact um, by us moving one way or the other. So we're sticking to our core strategy and our business and trying to do that as well as possible. So for those people who are watching who are not living in China, uh, when the average person now is walking down the street in Beijing or Shanghai, are they wearing a mask? Is are masks very common now? Masks are very common. Even before COVID, it was not unusual to see people wearing masks, less outside, but I attended many meetings over the last several years where somebody or a group, small group of people within the meeting may be wearing face masks. And the reason would usually be because they had a cold and they were being very considerate and not sharing or spreading that cold to others in the room. In COVID, everybody wore a mask. And um, Jack and, 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 but many of our business leaders, including Daniel, were absolutely adamant that this was, abs was critical to stopping the spread. Right. And today you see selectively people wearing masks in the office. So you have a large family, nine children, and uh, you are uh, older than 25 or 35 yourself. You're not as old as I am, but you're you know, you know, a little bit older than you were a few years ago, let's say. So you yep. must worry about your health. So how have you worried about making certain you don't get this virus and all about your children? You have nine children living together. How do you deal with all that? You know, the standard that, that we've adopted is of course the social distancing, washing your hands, wearing a mask. The most important thing we've done is to wear masks. Um, not when we're all together in the house because we're not, into, you know, we're not socializing with other people. But if we go to a store, or if we go outside and we see other people, we wear the mask. And a lot of this I understood because COVID happened first to us in China. So I looked at the precautions that our leadership group developed for all of our employees whose safety was our number one priority. And we took those precautions and we applied them to our family. So going forward, eventually we'll have a vaccine, I suppose. Eventually the world will come back. I don't know when, but sometime hopefully soon. Will there be anything you learned in the COVID period that you will 
use going forward? Will you manage the company differently? Will you interact with your colleagues differently? Will technology be different? What would be different going forward in your view at Alibaba? You know, the big theme, David, that, um, that characterizes the post COVID environment and it's already taking place in China and outside of China is this notion of digitizing um, or having a real digital strategy for businesses that have offline operations. And we talk about in the context of new retail, which is the integration of online and offline, but the digitization of the entire retail value chain. So that's everything from manufacturing to your supply chain, to your warehousing, to your offline stores and your online virtual store and the integration of all of that. The benefits are for, for consumers are enormous, which is they can buy anything, anytime, anywhere, do whatever they want. But for merchants, it makes the difference quite apart from the cost reductions they can, that they can recognize. They'll be able to operate their offline assets if we go back into, at any time, a lockdown situation where consumers just aren't going to go to those, sto to those stores. And in many cases, those offline stores can become fulfillment centers for online orders. So this is a theme that used to be sort of, well, that's really cool and that would be nice to have. It's gone thing from being a nice to have to a structural imperative. So you do not speak Mandarin, though you probably understand some of it, having lived there for a while, but why do you not need to speak Mandarin if in a Chinese company? I guess, is, do they speak English when you're having board meetings? You have interpreters, how does that work? When we have board meetings, they speak English because a number of our external directors don't speak Chinese. Some do, um, but we do it in English. But if you asked me, David, what's my one regret um, about being an employee of Alibaba? I wish I spoke Mandarin because all of our leadership meetings are in Chinese. Um, and most of my interactions with my Chinese colleagues are also in Chinese, which I'm totally fine with. Um, I just wish that I was a little bit younger and had the opportunity to learn the language. Well, my experience with foreign languages, after a certain age, it's very difficult to learn them. And the time expended is probably not worth it considering the other things you would be doing with that time. That's my theory, at least. It's true, but as a sign of respect and an appreciation for the importance of the culture, um, it's something that I've, I've made some effort on, but I wish I'd made more. So today uh, you would say that uh, Alibaba's in pretty good shape what are your biggest worries about the future? My biggest worries about the future are, you know, focused entirely on our business. Um, in China, our biggest challenges are how do we take this enormous platform, which is actually quite complex, but make it easy for consumers and make it a great um, platform for merchants to develop their, their, their businesses. And our second big challenge is, is just the innovation and the technology that's required to stay ahead of the competition, but also to make Alibaba a lifestyle app. What does that mean? That means, yes, of course, it's a place you go to shop, but it's also a place that you can live and work and play. Geez, this is a big challenge. It's very hard. So I was not much of an athlete, obviously not an Olympic athlete, but the key to being an Olympic athlete is just hard, hard work and just dedication and focus. And, you know, if anybody wants to be an Olympic athlete, uh, what would you recommend that they try to do? Well, <laughs> in large part, David, that depends what sport they play, but teamwork and discipline, you know, my heart goes out to the people in, um, that missed the Tokyo Olympics. I suffered that similar experience in 1980 when, President Carter boycotted the Moscow games and Canada followed suit. So I know what it feels like. Um, and my statement to them is stick at it. Four more years is a painful amount of training, but it's worth the wait and you will win. And do you think there will be an Olympics next year? I certainly hope so, but we're gonna rely on President Bach, the IOC and the Olympic organizing committees in Tokyo to make that final decision. But uh, Fingers crossed for all of those athletes and everybody else associated with the games. So uh, you have a twin brother that you won the gold medal with. Is that right? Correct. Now he doesn't work at Amazon, right? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. No, so he's not uh, doing something similar to what you're doing. Is that right? No, we, we started off in investment banking together. It's sort of an interesting story, David, because um, 
I had initially hoped to go to the Harvard Business School, but was rejected. I was then convinced that consulting was where I belonged, but the consultants didn't have a, a sort of a compelling uh, inclination to make that happen. And then it occurred to me, since my brother was going to an investment bank, maybe I should follow him, uh, which is exactly what I did. Well, I interviewed Warren Buffett once and he was rejected Harvard Business School as well. So I don't think you should worry about that. You've done extremely well. And I want to thank you for uh, giving us this time today and congratulations on your success at Alibaba. Thank you very much, David. Much appreciated.